Hello, everyone in the room. It's lovely to see you and hello, everyone online. Um, as I was just saying, this is um, one of our, this is our first hybrid in person and virtual people and planet um, series. And I'm grateful for whatever form you're joining us in. I'm Jessica Hellman. I'm the executive director of the Institute on the Environment, the place where you find yourself this afternoon, virtually and in person. I also am the um, consortium director for the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. And I'm, it's really a wonderful pleasure to invite you all here today. Uh, for those of you who are online, um, the Our People and Planet series is going to be in this hybrid for format. We will have some others coming up in the near future. And I invite you to come join us in person. Uh, of course, it's wonderful to um, it's a wonderful resource to be able to view online and catch content that way. But we are also a scholarly community. And so the opportunity to interact in person is also quite important to us. And so we really welcome you. If you find this interesting and you'd like to come in person next time, please do. So this People and Planet uh, is series, seminar series, is a public series. We, we launched this platform at the beginning of the pandemic because we wanted to have a space where we could have conversation, not just seminar style presentations, but discussions about many different intersections of sustainability in the environment, and um, also often including climate and the human and natural systems that shape our world. So this hybrid environment and being together physically is a new chapter for our People and Planet um, series. And, uh, so I guess you're all you're undoubtedly all eager to get to our main event and I stand between you and our panel, but I have a couple items I'd like to talk with us about. First, before we start, I want to acknowledge that the Institute on the Environment offices, those of us who are here in person, um, like the rest of the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, sits on traditional and treaty land of the Dakota people, land that was taken from Native people. And as a scholarly community, committed to building a sustainable future, it's especially important to acknowledge the Dakota people on whose land we live, we learn and work. We also understand that Dakota and Ojibwe knowledge systems are really crucial ways of knowing and loving and understanding this place we now call Minnesota. And we honor the people who keep that knowledge. And the Institute on the Environment particularly commits to improving and strengthening university relationships with our tribal nations. But we go about learning. Uh, learning is an important way of engaging in respectful conversation. Today, we learn about indigenous knowledge through advancing conversations, what we're dedicated here today to do. And I want to speak also, I think frequently about what it means to be an immigrant to this region of which I, to the state of Minnesota, I am an immigrant, a recent one, relatively speaking. But many of us also have ancestors who were immigrants to this region, who were colonizers of this land. And uh, those immigrants, we have a duty to become informed about who has lived here for millennia and what happened here. Why do we need to do that? Because we need to be able to contribute to a restorative future visioning and um, with tribal nations and our tribal partners. Uh, so, your participation in today's event is actually a, it's perhaps a small part of this work that we do together to learn uh, and to understand so that we can build a shared future that is restorative together. So thank you for being part of that, that work um, of which we engage in today. A couple quick logistics. Our speakers um, will uh, and I'll have a moderator and speakers who will engage in discussion over the next hour. If you have questions, we're reserving time at the end of the discussion. They will converse among themselves and then answer questions. So even if you're in the room, you can use this slido.com number. So you go to slido.com and type in this number, 1127040. Maybe we'll put that in the chat if we haven't already. And we'll take questions from there uh, and we'll, we'll hope to address as many of them as possible. I also need to point out that we are recording this conversation so that we can share it um, in other related resources with the entire community, uh, INE community. Okay, next is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator. 
uh, Dr. Mike Dockery. Mike is an assistant professor in the Department of Forest Resources here at the U. He's also uh, a fellow of the Institute on the Environment, and he serves as the program lead for tribal relations for the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center, which is a collaboration of eight organizations, uh, universities, tribal college, tribal natural resource management agency, and uh, nonprofit organizations, together with the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, the Midwest CASC, as we call it, is based here at the U, and it provides cutting-edge research and um, for, and adaptation practitioners literally generates people, the, pe the knowledge and the people that we need to steward precious resources into the future. So Mike is himself a leading expert on today's topic, but he's also a masterful collaborator and partner to many people in, the nat in natural resource agencies and tribes and many other parties working on climate and conservation. So he's really the perfect person to be guiding today's discussion. So. Thank you, Mike. Welcome, and I will turn things over to you. Thank you. Wonderful introduction. Hello, all my friends, my relatives. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Thank all of you for coming. Um, this topic is really important, and I think I do a lot of forestry. I've been engaged in the U.S. Forest Service and tribal forest management. And a lot of times we kind of head out west, right? There's lots of forests out west, lots of fires. We see things on the, on the news every summer, and now it's becoming more and more common even outside of the summer. We see fires, but we don't think a lot of fire here in the Great Lakes as much as we do out west. We also don't think of our tribes as really leading the way in fire here as we do out west. And we're here to show you and I think talk about the leadership that tribes are really showing in this area of fire, fire restoration, um, ecosystem, and our own relationships, restoring our relationships with fire in place as a key component to being adaptable moving forward for things like climate change, et cetera. So we've gathered an amazing panel to talk about this today. I'm going to introduce each in turn, and we're kind of lined up in the order that we're going. We'll talk for maybe a half hour or so. We'll show some really amazing slides. I was thinking, oh, we'll do this without slides, but thank you for bringing slides. Because fire, <laughs> you see these pictures, they're dramatic. Um, you can feel in your heart when you see these pictures. So I'm really excited for this. So first, I will introduce Lane Johnson. Lane Johnson is a research forester at the University of Minnesota here in our Cloquet Forestry Center. Lane has done a lot of work with bringing fire back, and he'll talk about that, and working with the Fond du Lac Band in particular um, for fire restoration. Next, we have Melanie Montano. Melanie is a graduate student here in Forest Resources um, at the University of Minnesota and uh, is an expert and has done a lot of work thinking about fire, thinking about culture and how our relationship uh, with fire is, um, has happened. Uh, Melanie is a member of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Um, and finally, Farron David Davis Anderson. And Farron is the supervisory uh, environmental scientist for the Shakopee Mdewakanton Sioux community. Uh, Farron's a Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa um, tribal member. And Farron has done a lot to really put that fire on the ground and really start restoring these ecosystems um, and engaging the community in this. So we really have a wonderful panel. I think at this point, um, I'll turn it over to Lane here. I don't know if you want to stand up and go over however you feel comfortable. That's for, for sitting. That's All right. Nice. All right. All right. <laughs> Thanks everybody for being here and, and taking time out of your, your busy lives to learn with us. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here because this is a lot of what I, I think about and share with others and uh, to kind of have this as a, a venue or a platform, it's great. And to be able to, to share with others that I respect. Um, so thank you, Mike, for the introduction, Jessica, for the introduction as well. Um, so I guess, uh, could we go to the first slide here? Uh, so I'm from Southern Minnesota, grew up uh, in a place called Northfield, corn country, and then uh, moved to Duluth, Minnesota, kind of fell in love with the Northwoods. And uh, my first job out of college, I uh, graduated from University of Minnesota Duluth, 
uh, from the geography program with a focus in uh, GIS, geographic information systems. Was working uh, seasonally for the US Forest Service. And I had the good fortune of stumbling into a position doing uh, cultural resource management or as an archeological technician for the Forest Service. And so I was able to basically work across the entire Superior National Forest, the, the Arrowhead region of Northeastern Minnesota, uh, doing cultural resource compliance work for different types of Forest Service projects. And one of the landscapes I got to spend a lot of time in was the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness that many of you are probably familiar with. And um, so I, kind of as a young, uh, a 21, 22 year old, I was in a canoe for, you know, five to eight days with, uh, with archaeologists and paddling through this landscape that um, uh, I was raised and kind of taught to think of as a pristine wilderness and spending time doing that for three seasons, you begin to look at the landscape differently. Um, uh, once you've given, been given sort of a, a cultural lens and, uh, and it just completely blew my mind, <laughs> to be completely honest. And uh, began to see this wilderness landscape, uh, the Boundary Waters as a, as a cultural landscape um, from the archeological work we were doing. Um, and, uh, you know, a place that has many stories and uh, also, I wanna say, uh, kind of an, an invisible landscape, if you will, where you have to really uh, kind of think beyond what you're actually looking at to understand uh, the significance of each place you are. Um, and so the photo we have here, uh, this is something that was shared with me by one of my archeologist colleagues uh, just several years ago, but um, something that he came across in an uh, 1894 uh, Bureau of Ethnology report. Um, and this photo was used to describe uh, conditions on the Fond du Lac Reservation uh, in uh, around 1890. And it's not a photo that was actually taken uh, on the Fond du Lac Reservation. It was taken by a St. Paul photographer and likely was taken someplace either in uh, Northeast Minnesota or Northwest Wisconsin, maybe someplace between St. Paul and rural Wisconsin or Duluth, Minnesota. Um, and I, if we're talking about people and fire and the environment in the Great Lakes region, I think this is just an iconic uh, photograph, if you will, showing uh, early or sort of uh, forest conditions in uh, this part of the country at the onset of colonization. And here we've got uh, an Ojibwe uh, elder, uh, likely a grandmother kind of at right. And this is uh, described as an Ojibwe blueberry camp. And the, the resolution of the photo is really great. If you kind of zoom into these different spots, you can see um, char on these red pine trees, uh, Minnesota state tree, uh, there's a whole lot of different types of medicinal plants in the foreground. You can see there's a fire pruned oak in the foreground that's re-sprouting. So we know this site had burned just a year or two prior to this photo being taken. And there's just a whole lot of um, ecological and cultural information we can, we can glean from this. And so I want to share this as an example of sort of what, um, what Euro-American uh, settlers kind of came here and, and discovered. Uh, discovered, quote unquote, um, or air quotes, um, and decided to stay. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this is a photo that was, was dug up uh, by some uh, volunteers at the Carleton County Historical Society. And I'd seen a, a scan of this, um, and this is a, a much higher quality print. So this was a, a photo that was taken uh, pre-1918 pre uh, at the Cloquet Forestry Center within the Fond du Lac reservation, and it's uh, titled uh, Presbyterian Church Picnic. And uh, you can see that the forest conditions are very similar to what's depicted in, um, in the last image, but uh, there's, there's no Ojibwe uh, encampment, a uh, blueberry encampment, but there's a bunch of, uh, of Scandinavians and Finlanders uh, and, and others that are out um, taking advantage of like a really picturesque spot uh, that's believed to be where the Cloquet Forestry Center buildings and grounds are now, or potentially another area that had not been cut um, uh, around 1910. And so this is one of the few places in the Cloquet area in Northeastern Minnesota where you could go, uh, you know, drive from Cloquet and actually be in trees. 
because every place else across the landscape had been had been cut um, and had been burned over. And so uh, this is just an example of, of Euro Americans um, taking advantage of uh, what I would consider consider to be a cultural landscape. Uh, next slide. How am I, do I need to go a little faster? Maybe a little bit, but okay. <laughs> so, uh, this is just an example of a fire scarred red pine on the Leech Lake Reservation. And these are the types of ecological and cultural records that are just hiding in plain sight. And so this red pine um, has a record of 15 scars on it. And uh, these are the types of trees that were, were cut down across the state. And this is the type of ecological record that informs how we could be working and living with fire uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan now. Um, but it's, it's difficult for us to find these. And where they do exist, sometimes people don't even know what they're looking at. So this particular site has had ecological work done previously, and, and one fire was reported for this site in a peer-reviewed uh, publication. And when you go back and you understand what fire scar material looks like, you realize, oh yeah, this um, landscape has um, more, more of a fire history than uh, we're previously aware. Uh, next, next slide. And then uh, this is a photo from just last year at the Cloquet Forestry Center. And we're using these tree and fire history records, um, the historical photos, many other lines of evidence, including oral history um, to inform how we're bringing uh, fire back to these um, fire dependent pine uh, landscapes and thinking about fire as both an ecological and cultural process uh, that we can all uh, kind of take part in regardless of our, our cultural affiliation, but here we're working really closely with the Fond du Lac Band um, to bring fire back to a portion of the university lands. Um, and it's been a really uh, uh, exciting and rewarding uh, partnership. I'm looking forward to highlighting that a bit more. So I'll shut up now. <laughs> Melanie, please take, take it away. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to take a second to introduce myself in my language to the Wushube Gumikum Gukwe Indigenicas, Eskabikang and Junjiba, Megas Yinto Dame. Again, Melody Montana with the Red Cliff Tribe, and I'm a student here in the Natural Resources Sciences Management Program um, in the Forestry Department and on the Tribal Natural Resource Management Track. Um, and I just wanted to mention that because that's who I'm here on behalf of. I wear multiple hats. Um, Besides being a mom, grandma, tribal member, I also work for Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, and so one thing I just want to talk about since our time is flying already um, is basically Lane mentioned a little bit the work that's being done on in our region on fire. And I want to mention why that even matters. So there's a lot of people out there um, that aren't alone. And Lane was in this place one day too, as he talked about his journeys on the boundary waters where there's this understanding that uh, this area, this region, when the Europeans came was real pristine, magical, and it was like that just upon discovery. But really it was that case um, because my ancestors, the Anishinaabe people were interacting with the landscapes, um, our relatives out there, the spirits out there, everything, and being completely connected with nature and knowing how to manage those landscapes and so when Smokey the Bear came along, it really nailed that uh, idea and understanding in the people's head because all of a sudden, not only was this area apparently pristine and untouched by man, but also then all of a sudden it became illegal for us to be doing any of those indigenous practices such as burning our landscapes because we were fined and put in jail and things like that. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit briefly, just so that you understand the importance of fire and we'll get more into indigenous fire, cultural fire versus prescribed fire and what that means. Um, but a little bit about my journey and why I'm here. So I grew up on the reservation majority of my life and all growing up, um, I spent a lot of time with elders, harvesters, gatherers, and they would often talk about those times when their own parents were arrested. And back then our families had like 14 kids. And if one person was arrested and put into jail, well, your family goes hungry during that time. And for us, that was a part of our lifestyle, a part of our culture, a part of our language, a part of our society, our ceremonies, everything. It's basically how we live. Um, and so I always had it in my mind that 
we were always connected to fire. Fire was always connected to us and fire was on the landscape as long as, you know, there were forests and then people came along and we developed this strong connection to fire and the government has tried to push us away since. Um, and so eventually I became involved with fire in a whole other aspect. Uh, the father of my children has been a wildland firefighter and so I was kind of connected that way, but I sort of came back around to it in the last few years when I ended up um, back in the lands of Black LaCroix where I also did a lot of work, Black LaCroix, Ontario. Um, growing up, I was brought there to learn a lot about um, our ceremonies from those relatives and that region and things. And eventually I got um, connected with Lane and Evan Larson who was doing some work up there and brought back to that community and kind of helped these guys to communicate with the folks in that community and understand like, this is how we talk about fire from the indigenous perspective. And that's the language that I know. And so now we've all kind of come together and we're learning about fire from like all these different aspects and pieces. Um, but I just want to say the importance of this, the picture on the your left there is Stockton Island. So that's part of the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. And for that particular park, um, the idea has been for a long time since the National Park Service came along into our lands as the Ojibwe people, um, that again, that land was apparently pristine and untouched, which was not the case. We were out there hunting, harvesting, gathering. And eventually through studies, they found that there was fire definitely on that landscape. And so a few of us had pushed to return fire on that landscape. And I just wanna point out this particular photo because uh, this is actually what we call a tree marker, I guess, for poor terms. Um, but that signifies that, you know, we were there, we were probably doing ceremonies there, fasting there, things like that. And so returning fire to that landscape was extremely important to us. And I want to point out the picture on the right, which was some uh, research project that I'm currently involved in, which is uh, looking at fire history on Wisconsin and Minnesota points, uh, Superior and Duluth, um, and looking at you know the frequency of that and basically proving that these landscapes are like that because we were managing fire and it's time for fire to come back to those lands. And so this was just this summer where we we're analyzing some tree rings and that's my grandson there with our research partner and friend, Evan Larson. Um, and so I just wanna stress the importance that now is the time to bring fire back and it's for our young ones who are moving into the future who it needs to be brought up into their minds of how important that is and how it's a part of us and we can't separate ourselves from the landscape or fire. Um, next slide, please. And so earlier I mentioned uh, the fine and so this picture is thanks to Thanks to Lane here. Um, this fire or this picture always throws me off because I think about the severity of that. You know, in the early 1900s, my uh, late grandpa, who was alive during that time, had, I believe, 17 kids. My dad is one of them. And how devastating that would have been had you been out picking or had you been out um, setting fires to the ground and all of a sudden you're getting fined $5,000 in today's. In today's time, it's $167,000. And what happens? Do you risk your life? Do you risk your children going hungry um, and sitting in jail for 30 days? Like, what do you do? You stop and you turn to pulp peeling as a form of, you know, living basically. And that detaches you from the culture, the landscape, your identity, everything. And next slide, please. This is yours. Me. I believe. <laughs> keep going, Melanie. Keep going. <laughs> but, um, so thank you for inviting me here. Um, we do and didn't we going to do Ani, Baron Davis Anderson, Indigenous Cause, Mikinok, um, Mikinok, Wajui in Dunjaba, Sipa Singh in Dunji. And what I said there was hello, my relatives. My name is Baron Davis Anderson. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, and I grew up on the reservation um, in North Dakota, Belfort, North Dakota. Sipa Singh is our traditional name for Belport. Um, so my journey with fire has been, um, hasn't been since my youth. I, I kind of got into fire after, after college. So I started my college career at the Turtle Mountain Community College and I got a, um, a research position there um, looking at the bloom dates of Lady Slipper and Prairie Rose. 
And so that was an opportunity for me um, to realize that I could have a career in the outdoors. And before that, I didn't, I was like, whoa, I can be outdoors and you know, this could be my career. That wasn't even a thought. Um, so after that, I transferred to North Dakota State University and I got my undergrad in natural resource management. And I remember at the university, there was a course offered for getting your red card. And if anybody knows what that is, it's basically a qualification, a federal qualification through NWCG. Um, and that's the National Wildfire Coordinating Group. And um, so that says that you have this qualification that you can do these prescribed burns. And I remember thinking, ah, that's not for me. <laughs> I don't want to do that. And then um, I got my first position, my first like career. Um, I started out in the Conservation Corps of Minnesota and they required you get your red card. <laughs> and so that's like, I remember going to the classes and uh, they kept talking about how you're going to go out west and you're going to look at all these different fires when you go out west. And I was just thinking, I'm never going out west. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I don't want to do that. Um, so, so my relationship with fire has really evolved from that time to now. Um, so when I started working for the Shakopee Metawakan Sioux community, I started as an environmental technician and they already had a program going for about 20 years. So we restored over a thousand acres of prairie. And if you don't know where Shakopee is located, it's just 30 minutes uh, Southwest of here. So we're in a really urban area. And so when I think about how we are able to get fire back on the landscape in our communities, I, I'm thinking, hey, what are you guys doing up north? <laughs> like, we got a lot of stuff to worry about down here. Um, and that, you know, there's a lot of barriers and, I, and we'll talk about that too. But um, so that's kind of my background, how it started. It was really in a Western setting, right? So I got that training through um, these federal agencies and, what I thought was, I'm going to have to get this training um, because I eventually want to be a burn boss. And I wanted to understand, you know, how logistically you can do burns on, on the landscape. And then I also wanted to be able to incorporate that science because in a lot of agencies, they have those two groups of people separated, right? So there's people that are fire managers, and then there's the um, ecological biologists and two different separate, you know, entity silos it feels like sometimes and so I wanted to be able to merge those two things and understand what it takes and be able to you know make really good decisions on the, about the landscape of Chakti and so that's um that's kind of what drove me to really um do those trainings and to get into fire and then it like really dawned on me after talking to a lot of different people and elders and going to different trainings and meeting different people from different tribes like we, how am I going to, I needed to revitalize my relationship, my cultural relationship with fire too, because I was looking at, at it through a Western lens, right? And so for me, I needed to be able to understand like that that fire has its own spirit and I needed to be able to bring my culture into um, the programming that was at Shakopee. And that's, you know, that was, that was, I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to figure out ways that we can do that, how we can bring the community into activities that we're doing um, and and just understanding the again the barriers that are in place to prevent our communities from burning um, so you can go to the next slide I don't remember that's me in, in South Dakota so um, I was on a fire and it's, it's so to get these qualifications um, you often have to go on wildfires. So I don't really like putting out fires. <laughs> I like starting fires. <laughs> um, but un with under this system that we have in place, you usually have to go out on wildfires to get these qualifications. And because um, the tribal land is, is considered federal land, you have to abide by policies that are in place that say you need these qualifications to burn. So if I don't have these qualifications, like I don't, I can't burn here. So that's, I, I was on a wildfire <laughs> and, we, and I got to burn. So that's, that's awesome. Um, this is a prescribed burn that we were conducting at Shakopee. So you can see in the background, like, there's, there's houses really close. We're really cognizant of where we have to um, put our smoke. Obviously there's a lot of uh, sensitive receptors around us or you know, we have to think about our, our you know, elementary schools around our, their, um, senior citizens living nearby. And that's always something that, 
you know, you have to balance when you're in a really urban setting. You go to the next slide. And so one of the ways that I've been able to, you know, revitalize my relationship with fire is to be able to attend trainings like this. So this was the crew um, indigenous women's uh, in fire training. And this was held last, it was last September, the end of, yeah, the end of September, or October. And I was able to go to that, um, that training and work with some amazing women out there. So if you haven't ever heard of the Karuk tribe, they're really leaders in Northern California with trying to get fire back on the landscape. And I was just blown away by their knowledge that they still have about fire, um, like their traditional uses of fire. Um, and you know, they have, they know specifics about like how they're conducting fires, right? Like we know like, um, culturally, we obviously we know that there was fire here, but like I don't have a really good idea. Maybe these guys do of how our ancestors would have been would have been conducting those burns, though, right? Like what materials they were using when they were doing um, burns. Um, you know what areas and how they use different you know markers on the landscape to get burns to do what they wanted to do because obviously they were they were using fire very sophisticatedly. Um, and you can see from those pictures, like they were, you know, using it to um, <coughs> boost blueberry production. They were using it to clear camps. They were using it to um, bring grazing animals into certain areas. And so what we use that term today, then that's patch burden grazing. But that's essentially what, you know, our ancestors were doing too. When they wanted to bring game to certain areas, they would burn areas because they knew that that was attractive for wild game. Um, and so, yeah, that this group of people really helped broaden my perspectives of um, some of the uses, even like they have a lot of basket makers there. And so that really got me thinking um, about the different plant relatives that we have here. And, you know, it's our it's our duties as Anishinaabe people to understand what our relationships are with those plants and, and what gifts that they have. And so understanding how fire is interacting with those relatives too is, is important. So that's something that I'm always trying to continuously learn about too is like, well, you know, and a good example of that for me right now is sweetgrass because I just learned how to make sweetgrass baskets. <laughs> and so that's something that I've been thinking about. Um, so we, I was talking to the lady who was my instructor and she was saying she's from Grand Portage. And she was saying that she normally orders sweet grass from someplace in Washington. And the reason she does that is because it's really long and it's, it's nicer when you're weaving because then you don't have to add as much grass. And then I was thinking, well, maybe these landscapes here, the grasses just aren't growing as long because there's not fire here anymore. And so how is that going to, how would that impact, you know, that grass? And how would that make a better material for our baskets? And so those are things that, you know, I've constantly about now. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's that's we can talk more about this. Um, but uh, I think we wanted to open it up for questions. Yeah, I think yeah, okay. So you're you're going here. Thank you. This was great. Uh I realized as you all sort of introduce yourself, I said I introduced myself more in Potawatomi, but um for me I've been I've been thinking about fire. 30 years ago when I was an undergrad and grad student, uh, I was looking at tree rings and doing this kind of research and I was really interested in how this all plays out. I'm a member of the citizen Potawatomi nation, and that's what I told you. Uh, we are the people of the fire, we keep the fire. So this is like culturally important. This is something that I've done, but have gotten away from. And now I'm hoping kind of to move forward with you know, the guidance of you all and others into how we get this fire in the landscape. I think it's really important. You'll even see recent debates on from some of the New England forests looking at data and thinking, well, correlating fire with the number of people. That's when I was 30 years ago, that was all the rage in ecology, it seemed like. How many people were here? And that tells us how much fire we have on the landscape. And my, my question back then and still is, it's, well, how many people do you need to start a forest fire? <laughs> One, and that's not the right question. And Farron, you hit on it 100%. What is our relationship with fire? And that will give us a better understanding of the landscape changes and the processes and our, and our role in, in maintaining these. I was gonna start with 
one question, but I think I want to dig in maybe with, and, and if you don't have an answer for this, that's great. But I think for Farron and, and uh, Melanie, what you mentioned a women's training out with Karuk. Have you thought about women's role in fire? And, and is that something you could talk about for a little bit here? <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like, especially out in that training, I got a real, uh, the fire was lit within me. <laughs> um, but yeah, like those women out there, they're leaders in this and um, they're the ones in their communities pushing for this to happen, right? Because those basket makers, are typically women and they're like we want better materials for our baskets <laughs> so um that's something too like within our communities i feel like us as women you know i've heard too that traditionally women were the keepers of water and men were the keepers of fire but i think you know we have evolution of our practices too and we can and we can really be leaders um in our communities with you know ecological restoration and and making sure that that relationship is intact with fire to and in revitalizing those practices. Yeah, and it's interesting too from um, my aspect with working with elders and things is growing up, I would always hear about uh, rice bosses. So rice bosses are the ones, you know, usually the men that go out to the wild rice beds and say, when it's time to rice, because they look at the rice birds or they look at the trees or they look at the everything really they don't look at just the rice plant itself um and the more that I got into asking questions specifically about fire the more I started hearing about berry bosses and I was wondering what in the world are berry bosses and so berry bosses are basically the female bosses of fire and so what has been being talked about a practice that we've been moved away from basically forced upon us by the government um is that the women often would go out and they would look at the state of the plants or the berries and things like that and they would be the ones that would say okay it's time to burn or not burn or this area or that area and so they would come back and do that and so we're starting to kind of like reconnect with that knowledge that you know we've been pushed away from and I like to talk about it from the aspect of like cultural suppression and so we've had ecological suppression when you know our management practices have changed and things and it wasn't just about ecological suppression, it was also about suppression of our people, suppression of our language, suppression of our practices. So overall, cultural suppression, um, suppression of our entire identity and things. And so we definitely were finding as time goes more and more that we, we as women have had a definite connected uh, or a definite role um, and connection to fire. And we're starting to like relearn what that is basically and returning to it um, as we go. Eclipse, thank you, that, that, that's great. And I think I'm just gonna add on there. So you, you have, you showed that picture of the, um, the fines for fire. So that's not only, and you mentioned if you get incarcerated, then you're not able to feed your family. You're also not able to feed your family when these ecological systems are changing. But because of this lack of fire. So it's a very insidious thing. And I think women in fire too, there's been a lot of um, harassment that has happened in these fire camps. And so this is furthering that process. And I encourage everyone to see and think about these things as connected. And as we gain, regain and reassert our cultural connections to fire, some of these other ecological social problems will also recede into the background. So our, and we, again, we see like the group with this women's, fire training that's powerful stuff like restoring our cultures restoring our ecosystems and showing the western world how to actually do this in our environment i'll ask one more and then i'll i think i'll open up the slido so i'll put a plug in if you, i haven't looked at it yet but if you haven't put a question in slido i think you can also upvote so we can kind of see what questions are rising up but one of the things that i've been thinking about a lot and i know you all have thoughts on this as well is there's been a lot of effort to get prescribed fire back into the woods. Prescribed fire. That's something we've been hearing about, thinking about. Now I'm starting to hear indigenous fire. I wonder if you could reflect upon the differences you see or think about between prescribed fire and indigenous or cultural fire. I think Farron will be able to speak to that quite a bit, but um, before she does, I want to say a little bit 
because there's a couple different perspectives here and she'll be able to lay it out in a good way as far as prescribed versus um, cultural. But one aspect to think about it too is fire itself is indigenous. Fire itself was here before we came and fire is also cultural. <coughs> so there's that little component. And then when you look at it from like using fire in a practice way, there is different ways of going about it. Yeah, for sure. So for me, I think that <clears throat> you can conduct prescribed burns with cultural objectives, right? And and it's really why are you why are you burning and how are you interacting with that fire? And so anytime you do a fire too, a lot of um, people preface using prescribed burns for fuel reduction. But anytime you do a burn, there's some type of fuel reduction. <laughs> and so that doesn't necessarily always have to be your main objective, right? And so for us, <clears throat> what are we thinking about um, and how are we doing that burn? And so for me, the difference between prescribed burn and cultural burning is that for, for the practice of cultural burning is um, you're being part of something bigger than yourself. You're part of that community that's doing that practice. Um, when you're doing prescribed burning, you can, you can be doing that burn and not really feel that connection, connection to land. And so I've definitely been on prescribed burns where I felt like that, where it felt like, you know, we're just doing this to try to meet these objectives, to reduce the fuels, to, you know, boost plant production, which could also be considered, you know, a cultural objective. But when you're doing a, you're thinking about that fire in a different way and having, um, you're thinking about your relationship with that fire, I think then that turns into something that's more cultural and something that we need to bring our communities into and make sure that they're part of that too. Um, and, pres and prescribed burning, the system that we have set up for that doesn't really allow for that to happen because we have um, these qualifications that are needed, especially on our federal lands that um, you have to have to be able to be even on the fire line to participate. And so if we, on our tribal lands that are considered federal lands, if we wanna do prescribed burns, we can't have our elders on the fire line. And so that's something that I've thought about too, where it's like, well, this isn't you know, really part of the community if we're not allowing the community to participate. And one small addition to that, um, you think about the fact that we've been, us as humans have been using fire as long as we were on this earth, but how long have we been functioning under a system like this? Yet we're still here. These ecosystems are still here. They've been significantly modified because we've been removed from fire and our connection to it. However, we didn't, you know, back in, I don't know, 1200, we didn't have to get a red card, but we knew how to do it then. Yeah. All of a sudden we have to go through this system. So just some things to think about. Uh, I guess I think of um, prescribed fire as something that's oftentimes very uh, top down, whereas cultural fire can be very grassroots and bottom up. Um, and so, yeah, going back to what Farron said about the relationship to place or about community and what the community needs are, um, there can certainly be culturally informed prescribed fire. I think that that's what uh, we're in many ways doing at the Cloquet Forestry Center with the, the fire restoration there. Um, but it's not really cultural fire until we have community members out um, sort of breaking free of uh, the current um, sort of federal or state um, sort of restrictions around prescribed fire management and, and uh, doing the work for them uh, themselves rather than us kind of uh, being serving as intermediaries. Well. Yeah, no, another thing I'm thinking as you're, as you're all talking here is as wonderfully put by Robin Kimmerer, a Potawatomi woman, again, keepers of the fire, um, talks about learning from the land, right? We might, have, we might not know all the practices that we have had over many, many, many generations, but that land remembers. And as we dig in in our relationship with that land, it is quite possible that we are going to be learning from fire. Fire teaches, the plants teach, and we can be doing this, and, and it has been done. And so that's, that's something that I think is really beautiful when we start 
building our relationships back with fire um, and, and these, these landscapes. Excellent. I'm gonna go to Slido here. There's a question that a lot of people are interested in and it has to do with um, people that are doing ecological research around fire, particularly prairies, but I think we can add in forests as well. And um, what kind of research and work can, can folks be doing to support indigenous fire and land management? And then another like, kind of sub question is what questions should these researchers be asking? to better support all of your work. I see you, Lee, smiling a little bit in the front row there. I'm sure his wheels are turning because, yeah, we have, there's a lot of us out there, some doing on the ground work, some doing the research and some just like, you know, using it in our own backyards to clear our yards in the springtime and things like that. Um, so as far as like what questions I think one of the things that I like to encourage people to do is go to the indigenous communities and just simply start building relationships with them. And then eventually you can start to feel out or understand what questions you should be asking based on those conversations you're having. Because one problem that I've always had with the world of research is that some of that research often originates with an individual who thinks like, I have this amazing idea, I have this question in my mind, so I'm gonna carry it out. And it's, you know, these are the questions I wanna ask, but it's based on your own pathway that you've been on rather than as a collective approach with these people that have been on the landscape for, you know, centuries before the Europeans came on. And so I think like an answer to that really is to start building those relationships first so that those questions can come out in a natural way. Um, so that's part of the answer to the one of those questions, but I'll let these two speak to. Let's go first. I, I just wanted to agree with that completely <laughs> because I've been in situations too where I, working for a tribe, I've been approached with um, research proposals or projects. And for me, that's kind of, mind-boggling because how are you going to meet any of the community's needs if you don't understand what their needs are and so that's so important to be before you even want to you know assert yourself in, in those positions you need to be able to build relationships and, and come to the table and ask like hey um you know i want to learn more about what you're doing and how we can work together and um, it's also important to understand like a lot of tribes are doing really amazing things and to not underestimate, you know, the resources that they already have in place. Um, so that's another, you know, thing that needs to be discussed and, and uh, shared in these processes. Uh, a friend and co-conspirator at Von Black, uh, Rick, Ricky Defoe, uh, he has said something to me last spring that really stuck with me. And it was about natural law versus uh, human law. And uh, I think a lot of the barriers around getting prescribed fire on the ground or seeing uh, the pace and scale of prescribed fire um, increase is um, that kind of the realities of natural law are not, are not aligned with what our, our human uh, sort of laws or systems are, are set up to kind of allow or disallow. And so I think uh, going back to the like, question around research, I think uh, there's so many ecological and cultural reasons to get more fire on the ground, but what, what slows us down are, are these, these human constructed uh, limitations. And there can be a lot of great social science done in that realm about uh, policy, policy shifts that are needed um, to permit more uh, prescribed fire and more flexibility uh, when it comes to implementation. And also, uh, um, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, great. I wonder if anyone here in the room has a, a question they would like to pose to the panel. You can do it on Slido too, if you don't want to. <laughs> Anonymous. <laughs> yeah. I would just like to hear more about the, the role of seasonality and that kind of going out and assessing and making decisions based on the state of the forest, the plants, the, the place, as opposed to like, I feel 
feel like Western systems are like there's calendar dates and it happens on the 15th or the 18th or whatever. And it's like, well, but if the plants aren't in the right place, you're not going to get the right outcome. So I'm really, I, I would love if you should just share some perspectives on, on that. Yeah, it's interesting because it makes me think of Manuman or wild rice because there's state regulations that say these are the times you can gather. And then all of a sudden the state regulations don't time up with the time when the rice is actually ready, you know, for you or in the right, the rice is ripe or whatever. And same goes for fire. And when you look at um, the practices of indigenous people, some of that stuff was based on observation and the state of the conditions of the ecosystems, but it was also based on like what worked for their lifestyle. I mean, it was common sense kind of stuff. And so one example is, um, you know, a lot of times spring burns happen and that's because when money's available or things like that. But a lot of the indigenous people in this region, I can't speak to other regions, but in our region, we also did fall burns. And part of that reason was because there, there were different, you know, benefits, uh, ecological benefits, but there was also uh, like, what do you call it? Common sense kind of thing. So we, the indigenous people in this region functioned in the style of like camps. We had fish camp, rice camp, berry camp, like all these different things. And especially up in our Red Cliff area in the top of Wisconsin where the Apostle Islands are, we spent a lot of time out on those islands and which it took quite a while just to get out there. And so when it was berry camp time, you know, you would go out there with uh, families in a neighborhood and they would set up camp and they would pick berries and those berries would be brought onto, loaded onto a ship that was then brought onto the blueberry line, literally called the blueberry line, shipped down to Chicago and it was filled with blueberries. So imagine how much fire we had on the ground then. That's a whole side thing. But um, so when we were out there picking berries, they would have their ceremonies. They would, you know, hunt if they needed to hunt and they were surviving a couple of weeks at a time out on those remote islands. And before they would leave, they would burn. And so the, then by the time they would return to that island the next year, they would usually return to a different location of that island so that area they were burned could have its time to basically have a rebound, uh, be ready again you know, for picking the next go round. And so there was a lot of like rotational practices going on. Um, but a lot of it was just like, it's what worked because why would you go out there in the springtime, you know, when it wasn't time to pick those blueberries because the blueberries aren't ready till the fall time or whatever. And so some of it was just kind of common sense type stuff. Um, but a lot of it was phenological too. Um, you know, we knew how to survive by observing everything that was going on in the environment around us, the animals, the trees, the water, but also the spirits out there and, you know, relying on what the spirits would tell us when things were supposed to be happening, so. Look, at, we've got about six minutes left. Is there one, maybe one more question here from the audience? I'm sorry, I can't get to all of these, but I feel like some of the Slido questions have been answered um, as we've been talking here. Does anyone have another question here before I do the wrap up question? Well, I'll ask a question. You, um, several of you referenced that, um, Taryn, you especially talked about the West. Do you think that what, and lack of appreciation perhaps among the public at large about this significance in, of fire in the Great Lakes region. Well, is there any, are there lessons learned for our Western um, colleagues and what can the Great Lakes, this region, help us understand about Western fire? I know there are limitations about what we can learn from Western, but what about, does that question make sense? Like, what do we have to learn from the Western fire practices? All the way around. Vice versa. Okay. What do, we, what do we have to teach from this region that could be relevant in other regions where fire is such a um, top of mind and um, issue? Is there anything? I'm not sure if I'm fully understanding the question enough, but one thing I uh, think about, and let me know if I'm off mark with this, but also... I just want to acknowledge Lee Freilich because he is, you know, somebody who's done a lot of research around fire and in this area. And I'm in one of his classes now, and he makes me think more and more about this kind of stuff is that the state of our ecosystems, I mean, we look around the state of our ecosystems are, I don't want to say unhealthy, because as a human, I can't really judge that. But 
there's a lot that has changed, a lot that has been impacted and shifted because we haven't had fire there and that land and those beings out there like have this grief they're experiencing because of not seeing fire. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like one lesson is just to go out there and look at those ecosystems and think about what they used to be and not based on what the wilderness act said they were, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. That, that's great. Did you have something to add? I, I would say that um, we have a chance in the, in the Great Lake states to demonstrate a proactive response okay. to, to the fire risk issue and getting prescribed fire on the ground ahead of some really catastrophic, catastrophic events. Whereas out west, they're really behind the curve. They're trying to catch up. Um, and there's been so many devastating events in California, Colorado. Uh, last year is in northern New Mexico. Um, and so they're really reacting. And I think we're in a great position to show, all right, we, we can um, really be like, um, yeah, more proactive, uh, more thoughtful. Uh, it's like, it's not too late to get ahead of things here. Um, and I guess that's what gives me a little bit of hope. We've got time. Yeah. I feel. We still have a chance. All right, for the last two minutes here, I wonder, if you could all reflect upon where you see this all going in the future. What do you, what do you, what do you see with indigenous fire five, 10, 50 years in the future? Everybody's burning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the natural resources community, it's fascinating to see how people will take time off uh, work to, you know, for fishing opener or for uh, hunting, you know, going to deer camp. Uh, like that's kind of ingrained into our culture in the upper Midwest. Don't, you know, have a conference or a workshop during deer season because no one's going to show up. Um, and I hope that we can really grow that sort of uh, fire culture in the, the lake states and uh, across the upper Midwest where it's like, yeah, don't, uh, don't schedule me for that event um, at that time of year. Maybe it's, you know, early May because I'm going to be too busy burning with my friends and family. Uh, and so if we can get to that point, you know, 15, 20 years from now, and, and uh, the kind of conversation we're having now feels really archaic uh, uh, years from now, that will be uh, an awesome thing. Yeah, and for me, it's seeing and feeling healing. So in other words, like if we see fire returning to these landscapes, we're going to watch this landscape you know, these landscapes heal and we're going to heal in return because we're rebuilding those relationships, those connections, that cultural memory and everything. And so literally like seeing a lot of fire returning and seeing our people, especially in the indigenous people, healing from the historical trauma that we've done through. And that's kind of the journey that I've been on with this is finding my own healing and reconnection with fire because some of like some rough stuff I've experienced with it or whatever. And so seeing and feeling healing in us and on the landscapes. Yeah, I would like to see more of our um, indigenous people burning. I wanna see them as leaders with cultural burning. I wanna see more uh, fire on the ground. Um, and then just, you know, us having a really good understanding of, you know, the differences between prescribed burning and cultural burning and getting more of that cultural burning on the ground. Miigwech to each of you. This Miigwech. has been wonderful. Miigwech to all of you here, all of you online. I don't know, Jessica, did you wrap up or is you the wrap up? I'm the wrapper up. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, have a great rest of the day. Enjoy that sunshine out there today. Thank you. Thank you.